pray together. Heavenly Father, we often sing that your word alone is solid ground. So as we open up your word this morning, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear. Pray that as we leave here, we'd be better worshipers of you in light of the truth that we think upon as, as we open up the scriptures. We love you and praise you for this day. Be glorified now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we conclude our study of, of 2 John. If you've been here, you know, for one week, you've been here for uh, the entirety of that study. Uh, it went by quickly. I actually taken twice as long as many often take when they preach through 1 John. So two, two sermons will get us through these 13 verses. Again, this is really the second shortest book in the New Testament, so it hasn't required much time to think carefully through this concise letter. And um, while this, this study's only taken two weeks, much has um, happened um, in our church since we began this study. Um, and I just want to point out of significance for this morning, um, we have cold AC in the auditorium for, for this sermon. At some point last Sunday, maybe after I took a position on who the elect lady is in verse one, and, and then moving into quoting John when he considers the idea of maybe calling down fire from heaven on the Samaritans. At some point between those two points, someone uh, either sabotaged our AC or it just went out. But uh, boy, that proved distracting. I, I noticed for some of, some of you, it was, it was hot in here. But, but for me, with like this rotisserie pastor thing that, that goes on, it was, it was very difficult up here with the heat. So, so I'm thankful for, for the, the AC that we have this morning and pray that this will be a, a focused time in God's word that as we consider the rest of, of Second John, uh, it seems obvious to me as we look at this letter that, that John the apostle wrote this letter in addition to the gospel of John, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, we see John writing here this, this second letter as well as first and third John. And, and last week, as we began our study, we, we kind of walked through some similarities between all of John's writings to, to see how, how it's, it's obvious the, the same authorship amongst those, those five books. So as we walk through second John, we're, we're talking about one of the letters that the Apostle John writes to the church. Uh, and that's going to actually be made clear again this morning as we think through 2 John verses 4 through 13. We're going to walk through a variety of statements that he makes where, where we see various similarities with, with 1 John in particular, but also in the Gospel of John. And so, so a lot of what we'll be doing this morning will be turning between that second letter, 2 John, and turning back to, to 1 John on several occasions. And we'll also be looking at, at the Gospel of John as well as we think carefully upon this letter. Um, again, you're looking at it, you see 2 John is, the author is identified as the elder. And as we said last week, John was this last living apostle. And so even when we see this identification of the elder, it matches up with that, that idea of John as this last living apostle apostle. Uh, and it matches up with what we know from church history as well of John's ministry that he would have later in his life, even in this region that these letters would have circulated, and the ministry that he had in and around Ephesus. And so church history only adds weight to the reasonableness, the likeliness, the, 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 the clarity that, that, um, that John indeed was the author. We have internal evidence, we have external evidence that John wrote this letter. Um, that did not appear all that controversial last week. Um, I also suggested, though, that, that I find good reason from this letter to identify the recipients as a particular local church. So when you read in verse 1, the elder to the elect lady and her children... I see that elect lady and her children as referring to a particular local church. And so, just as Peter refers in one of his letters to 
She who is in Babylon greets you. That's Peter referencing a church. Uh, it seems entirely reasonable to me that, that John would be addressing a church when, when he writes in this letter to the elect lady and her children. So I provided several other reasons as well. Um, the plural pronouns that are used throughout the letter. We'll look at verse 13 today. I feel like that's a, a pretty clear um, point that, that I think we're talking about churches. We're not talking about um, a particular lady and her particular sister and their the nephews and nieces that would fall in line with verse 13. I think these, this is a local church in verse 1, and there's a local church in verse 13 that is sending their greetings to this church. So, as we walked through those first three verses in that greeting last week, I think there was a unique contribution that we explored from John in this letter. Second John might be one of the more neglected books in the New Testament, but there's something very significant that happens in this letter, and it's that you see the importance of truth, and you see the importance of love, and you see truth and love together in First John. Truth comes up five times just in those beginning verses. Love is repeated as well throughout the letter, but you find them coupled together. And so we, we even borrowed the words of, of Dale Ralph Davis to, to just acknowledge that virtues need companions. And so we discussed just the need for, for truth and love. A good bit of our time was spent on seeing the need for those two together. And that if they're not together, there's a deficiency and and, and an expense of one um, when you focus on the other. When you neglect one and focus on the other, it's really a deficiency of, of both. It's an expense of both when we don't walk in truth and walk in love. Truth matters. Truth matters in the life of a Christian. And so John shows us this so clearly in all of his writing, and Second John included. Um, he expounds even more thoroughly in, in First John on this reality of, of truth and how it matters. Our response to truth is actually evidence of genuine belief. So even though we'll be studying Second John this morning, let's, let's begin our time just looking at First John chapter 2. Truth our response to truth is actually evidence of, of genuine belief. 1 John chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, John says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Turning back to 2 John, just go to the right, just a page or two, we find a similar statement that, that characterizes just knowing the truth as, as what characterizes all believers. Just the very beginning of the letter. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. John writes of all who know the truth as those who, along with John, love this particular church. We're talking about a believer's love for other believers, and these believers are characterized by knowing the truth. Genuine believers know the truth, and that knowledge of the truth produces a love for others who know the truth. And so, with our Bibles open this morning, we'll look through the second epistle to John, and, and we'll begin in verse 4. John writes, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Keeping with my understanding of the elect lady as an individual church, it, it follows that when we read of, of this elect lady's children, we're, we're talking about this church's members. And so John embodies this love for other Christians as, as he and other believers delight in knowing that these 
Christians are walking in the truth. The joy that comes for John to experience this, to hear of this walking in the truth that's going on amongst this church family. And even as I was typing out my, my sermon, I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm looking at, at photos on my desk of even my own children, and I had to just pause and think just as a parent, when you think of the desire that every Christian parent has to see their children walking in the truth. So we pray for it. We, we train them. We teach them the word, and we pray that God would save them. We pray that our children would walk in the truth, and it's just the absolute same for a pastor uh, to, to desire the same thing for their, the children uh, the, the church, the, the members of the church, to desire to see our church walking in the truth. We find great joy as a pastor to see others walking in the truth. And John just represents this well with his statement, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. It's a joy to hear of, to observe, to see to actually be ministered to, to uh, be encouraged by members who are walking in the truth. Whether it's in seasons of of plenty, or whether it's in genuine difficult struggles, when when we hear of others that are walking in the truth, it brings great joy to pastors, it brings great joy to an entire church family to see others walking in the truth. And so we know this verb as we read, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. When we see walk in the scriptures, it's synonymous with the Christian life. So John is talking about their, their, their walk, their life, uh, that they are walking in truth. Paul in Colossians 1 uses walk this way. Colossians 1.10, he prays for the believers. He says that his prayer is that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul's prayer is that believers would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And that worthy walk that Paul prays for is characterized in that verse as bearing fruit, uh, increasing in the knowledge of God. So to walk, the Christian walk, is to bear fruit, is to grow in our love for the Lord, is to grow in our knowledge of the Lord. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That is an explanation of walking in the truth. In 1 John 2, John says, by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So, Here's how you know if you are in Christ. Are you abiding in him? Are you walking in the same way in which he walked? We we understand this is not saying match his physical stride, walk the same way that Jesus walked. We're talking about living uh, as the way that Christ lived. This is a call to Christ-like living. So what we believe affects how we live. That's what all of these verses are saying. If If we walk in the truth, if walking in a manner worthy of the truth is characterized by bearing fruit, of growing in our knowledge of God, if walking the Christian walk is characterized by walking in uh, the way in which Christ walked, we are talking about our life, our walk, ought to match up with how we live, what we say, what we believe. What we believe matters, how we live matters. Both of those are on display when we see that there is great joy that comes for the Apostle John when he sees this church walking in the truth. So as you continue in verse four, great joy in them walking in the truth, and this walking in the truth is just as we were commanded by the Father. Colin Cruz, in his commentary, he asks a question based on what we read at the end of this verse, uh, as commanded by the Father. He asks, what was the command of the Father, and when was it received? And so in answering that question, he looks back to 1 John 3. Let's do the same. Everybody turn to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to seek to answer the question, what was this command of the Father? When, When John says, I find great joy in you walking in the truth, just as it was commanded by the Father. 
First John chapter three, verse 23, John writes, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. That command from the Father is to respond rightly to Christ. It's to respond rightly to the message of the gospel. You see it there in verse 23. It says that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. This command from the Father is a command to believe in the truth. We're commanded to believe in the truth, and we're commanded to obey the truth, to love one another. This is the commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. The command from the Father is to believe the truth, to respond rightly to the truth, and to obey the truth, to love one another just as he has commanded throughout all of his letters. So verse 5 of 2 John certainly mirrors that reality that you see in 1 John 3. Walking in the truth, find great joy in that reality. And in fact, walking in the truth is commanded by the Father. Uh, 1 John 3 tells us this is the command of the Father, that you believe in Christ, that you love one another. And so, so verse 5 is going to mirror that. He says, And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Love one another. We've heard this before. This is not a new commandment. We just read it in 1 John. And then we just read it in 2 John. In fact, here in 2 John in verse 5, this is the sixth time that John has stated love one another in his letters. And it's, it's the last time that it will come up in, in, in these three letters. This is a final reference to this, this call to love one another. We're gonna continue to, to move back and forth between several of these letters. Go to the Gospel of John real quick. It, I said it happened six times in his letters. Well, where did he get this instruction from? Well, as a disciple of Christ, this is what he heard Jesus teach him as well. So turn to John 13. This command to love one another is throughout, not just the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament as well. And it's on the lips of Christ with his disciples in this upper room discourse. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Jesus has renewed this Old Testament command here in John 13, and uh, James Montgomery Boyce was helpful to me in this as reading through his commentary, just, just talking about um, the newness of this command from Jesus when we've read it before, you're thinking, in what sense is it new? It's old in that we've heard to love one another, but it's also new in the sense that Christ has raised this command to a new level. It is an entirely new level by the teaching and by the example of Christ. And so he calls us to this new command to love one another um, as, in light of the love that Christ has shown us, just as I have loved you, he says, you are also to love one another. So, 2 John 5 is just matching here what, what, what John was told in, in John 13. And so that's why he would repeat it six times in his three letters. In fact, it's one of those tests of the faith, right? If we think of, of the themes that are going on in 1 John, when, when he's writing that they may know that they have eternal life, that what he appeals to as evidence for their assurance of salvation uh, are, are these three tests. And, and one of those tests is this love test. If, if you desire to know that you are a Christian, it's important to know what is a Christian. It's important to know how do I become a Christian, but it's also vital that we understand um, how can I be sure that I am uh, a Christian. Uh, you look in First John and you see these tests, and the love test is one of those realities. Do you, do you have a love for the brethren? Do you have a love for one another? That is evidence of the faith. And so that's what John is interacting with here 
in 2 John 5. This command from the Father, uh, nothing new here. Uh, Now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. From the beginning. That's something that John says twice in his many verses. He refers to this reality. This is nothing new. It's something we've had from the beginning. And you're going to start to notice we're, we're about to get into an issue in 2 John where we start confronting these, where John is confronting these false teachers. And so what, what we're reading here is preparing us for that because one of the glaring errors of these false teachers was that, that they were prone to wonder, right? They, they wandered away from the faith. They've gone ahead. They've moved past uh, they, they've moved beyond the teaching of Christ. They've progressed in their, word, their mind. They've advanced past the teaching of Christ. They've advanced beyond that which is from the beginning. And that is the deadly error that these deceivers have committed. And so as John continues to appeal to from the beginning, he's reminding them this, 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 um, the truth is from the beginning. We believe the truth, the teaching, the teaching, the teaching of Christ. That is what we place our faith in. That is what we defend. That is what we contend for. That is what we believe is the truth that is from the beginning. And so these deceivers proudly are going to to proclaim their advanced knowledge, their innovative beliefs. And John will strongly rebuke their lies. Let me just read something from uh, Stephen Wellham in in relationship to this importance of believing that which is from the beginning. Uh, Interacting with John's letters, Stephen Wellham writes, just because a teaching is new does not mean that it's better. In fact, given its newness, it's more than likely something very old and something in error. The critical test of any new viewpoint, any new fresh articulation of the gospel is whether it corresponds to the faith, faith, whether it corresponds to the faith once delivered to the saints. I find that helpful because there is this attraction to newness, innovation, modern. We, we desire something new. And, and John's saying, stick to that which is from the beginning. Hold fast to the confession of the faith. Guard you know, the truth. Don't fall for this. In fact, John uses words that are, that are less flashy, less flashy, less, less edgy when he calls the Christians to remain, to continue, to abide. I mean, those almost sound like just average words, but they are not average words. They're, they're profound truths. To continue the wisdom in abiding in the truth of uh, remaining in the truth That is the call for every Christian. We confess the truth. We hold to the truth. We remain in the truth. We don't progress beyond the truth. There's progress in the Christian life. We grow in our Christ likeness, but we don't grow past the teaching of Christ. And so I hope that's clear. Uh, And I believe John's preparing us for that as he continues to say, from the beginning, from the beginning, this is what we hold to. Okay, so... We're commanded to love one another in verse five. This is no new command. We've heard it before. It's from the beginning. We've heard it from the get. And I believe John is interacting with his memories of John 13, that that upper room discourse, when when he reminds them this command to love one another is from the beginning. He remembers as as the Lord himself taught um, John and the other other disciples to love one another. Well, let's continue in in 2 John. We've looked at verse four. We've looked at verse five. Verse 6 reminds us of something else that is not new. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. In the life and ministry of Christ, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John, in his first letter, wrote, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Repetition then here in in 2 John, verse 6, this reminder of this obedience to
test in the life of a believer. This is love. Love is described here in verse six. What does love look like? Verse six, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Love for God is demonstrated through obedience. This is so clear in the scriptures. It's obedience to his commands. Obedience gives evidence of the fact that we are a genuine believer. This is, this is so important that we, that we get this right. Oftentimes in, in, in discipleship, I'll, I'll sit down with someone uh, one-on-one and we'll talk through the gospel. And we're, when, we, when we think through it, how does someone become a Christian, we recognize that, that you have this right gospel message and this is, this is borrowed even from like that partners program for some of you who've spent time in that discipleship program. You, you think that the right gospel and, and a right response to the gospel, repent and believe, that is how someone becomes a Christian. So, so what is a Christian? Someone who responds rightly to the right gospel. And that genuine believer then produces fruit. And so, so fruit is evidence of genuine conversion. But so often, people either remove the, the fruit from that equation, where it's just like, oh, it doesn't matter how you live, it's just that you, you respond to the gospel, you're saved, once saved, always saved, and it doesn't matter if there's any fruit in your life, that you made that profession. That's, that's often how people will understand how to become a Christian. But then we also know of, of the deadly dangers of, of moving that part of the equation to the wrong place. So if you think, how does somebody become a Christian? right gospel, right response, plus good works, that leads to becoming a Christian. Well, now you have just added to the gospel. It's no longer the gospel. It, it, is, it is a false gospel, and it's deadly. And so, so we see the importance of fruit as evidence of the faith. And in fact, that's what John is saying when he talks about um, real love for God is demonstrated through obedience to his commands. Uh, obeying his word doesn't make us right with God. But, but God, in showing his love towards us, he first loved us and, and gave us eyes to see, respond, respond rightly to the gospel, and we're saved. And then in that, that love for God, the, the, the new heart that, that he's given us, now we, we, we can walk in a manner worthy of our calling. We can obey his word. We can um, battle sin we can obey his commands. And certainly not perfectly. We're still sinners. If we say, we're not, if we, say we don't sin, we're lying. We're deceiving ourselves. We're calling God a liar. So, so um, John writes that we would not sin, but when we do sin, remember we have an advocate. We understand sin still remains, but, but love for God is demonstrated through obedience to his commands. And so that's what's going on in verse six. This, this uh, love for God is demonstrated through obedience to his word this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. So what we've been saying in these verses is that believing the truth, walking in the truth, walking in love, they're all commanded from the Father. These are all characterizations of the Christian life, and all of them are for our good. It's, it's evidence, in fact, that we are children of God, um, and significantly related to this letter, it, it, it's going to apply to what we're about to read as we move into this, this, this right response to false teaching. Walking in truth is going to be vital. Walking in love. Uh, we want to think, what does it look like to, to, what does this demand to love look like when you have false teaching? What, how, how do I walk in truth? How do I walk in love when there's, there's false teaching in our midst? And so that's what we'll see as we move now into verse 7 and following. We go ahead and read here, just, just verse 7 for now. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Also not new, right? Everything we've been seeing so far, this is not new. The, the commands that we read about, uh, not new. The reality of many deceivers going out, not new. Jesus warned about it. It's, it's, it's on the tongue, on the pen of Paul. It's it's uh, it's. John, as well, is mindful of this. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and 
the Antichrist. The tragic reality of this, this letter and other occasions and letters that, that John writes is that there are many deceivers that are indeed a threat to the church. These deceivers, many of whom have, who've gone out from within this very congregation. I mean, if you think in 1 John 2 when he said, many have, have gone out from us, and by going out from us, they proved that they were never of us. I mean, these deceivers, many have, have origins even within the life of the church and they've fallen for this deception, and they have gone out from us. And so here John is saying that many have gone out from within, they do not continue, they do not remain, they do not abide, and that is made evident that they were never in the faith, and here is the situation as it's now unfolded in verse seven. They are deceivers, there are many of them, and what they are characterized by is that they do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. I mean, you know, when you think about the history of, of just even modern cults, you know, when we think of the origins of, of particular cults, our minds go to particular names. So if we think of, of Mormonism, you know, we think of Joseph Smith. And if we think of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, we think of Charles Taze Russell, Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy. You know, these names come to mind as founders of these, these cults. But here in 1 John, here's the origin of, of cults. Here's the original formula for the modern day cult. They're deceivers who've gone out into the world, you know, proclaiming their message. They've gone out into the world and, and their message is one where they do not think rightly about Christ. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. The deception that is here is subtle. It is counterfeit. It's, it's trying to give the appearance that, it, that it's Christian, but it is anything but, because they don't get Christ right, and so they are not Christians. Notice the error. It's, it's not in what, what they're saying. They're, they're kind of careful. They're trying to avoid public denial of, of, of uh, apostolic teaching here. They just don't confess. And I wish I wouldn't have even said just. They, they don't confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Christians confess. Christians are confessing Christians. We even looked at this around Christmas time when we were in 1 Timothy 3. This, this early confession of the Christian faith was 1 Timothy 3.15. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. That's the confession in 1 Timothy 3. We as Christians confess that Christ came in the flesh. But these deceivers, uh, their strategy is to counterfeit, and, and they do not confess that Jesus came in the flesh. They're subtle, they are opposed to the truth, but they're not clear in their op, uh, opposition. They, uh, they don't make that opposition plain. And so, so maybe you've interacted with individuals in this, in this manner. Have you ever had someone at your doorstep and, and you tell them, we don't believe in the same Jesus? And the response might often be, oh, I believe in Jesus. And, and so they want to give the appearance that they um, are Christian, but they, they don't believe the same things about Jesus. What they would not be able to confess is that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, who came in the flesh. Jesus is the, the two natures of Christ, that he is truly God and truly man. This is what these deceivers were unwilling to confess, and it's the same for, for cults today. So, what are we to think about such an individual? What does John think about such an individual? Look at, look at the end of verse seven. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. These deceivers are the ministers of the deceiver. They're doing the work of the father of lies. And this message is, is antichrist. It is against Christ. It is against the teaching of Christ. Many antichrists will rise up, we're told in 1 John, uh, teaching something opposed to Christ. Um, and and th this message is the Antichrist. 
So the emphasis for us in these past two weeks as we've been in 2 John uh, has been on how truth and love belong together. And so you can just imagine how the, the question, and maybe the question does already pop up in your own minds. Okay, we're characterized by truth. We're characterized by love. False teaching is out there. In fact, John says it's plentiful. Many deceivers have gone out. So, so how, do we, how do we apply this command? If truth and love belong together, and we have this repeated command to love one another all over the place in John, the, the question is, what does this love look like then? How, what is the loving thing to do when someone comes into your um, setting proclaiming a message contrary to the apostolic message? How, are we, how do we walk in truth? How do we walk in love when you have these deceivers deceiving, <laughs> you know, proclaiming lies? How, how do we walk in truth? How do we walk in love in that? And John, John is very clear as you look through the rest of the letter just look at some of the, these verbs that are used, I mean, in our English translations, to see, here, here's the right response. If you're gonna walk in truth, you're gonna walk in love in the setting with, with, with false teachers who are a threat to the church, watch out, he says in verse eight. We need to be alert. We need to be awake to this. Watch out, he says. Verse 10, don't receive them. You know, don't, don't allow them a, a voice to, to, to proclaim, that like in, in your church, you don't allow false teachers in to, to confuse and deceive. Don't receive them. And, and again in verse 10, don't receive them. Don't greet them. Because, in verse 11 he says, um, to encourage in their work is to participate in their wicked ways. And so, so we're told walking in truth, walking in love, even in the context of dealing with false teaching, we as believers need to watch out. Do not receive them. Do not greet them. To encourage their work would be to participate in their wicked works. So, so that's, that's what we'll walk through uh, for the remainder of our time. Verses 8 through 11, basically you're seeing that the first, this warning not to fall for their deception, and then following that warning of don't fall for their deception, then he's saying don't encourage their effort. Have nothing to do with, with encouraging the efforts of the false teachers. Verse 8, we are to be alert. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. We should not grow sleepy to the issue of false teaching. I think sometimes we, we can think this is, you know, we read about it in church history. We, we see it on the news other places. Uh, we even know about it in our own community. But, but with, within our walls, you know, we're good to go. We don't, you know, or within our relationships, within the associations that we're involved in, within this, that, and the other, we just can grow sleepy to the issue of false teaching. And, but we have to be careful. We have to be watchful. We have to be alert. In fact, this is what Paul says in Acts 20. It's the job of a pastor to be alert, to pay careful attention to the flock. He goes on in Acts 20, Paul does. He says, fierce wolves will come in. These wolves will come in from among you, among your own selves. There will arise men who speak twisted things, says Paul, and they do so to draw away the disciples. Um, that's what Paul writes in Acts 20. So, therefore, be alert. That's the job of the pastor. You often hear um, from, from this pulpit where names are named uh, when, when referring to certain false teachers. And it's all part of that job description of the pastor to, to make us aware, be alert to the reality of false teaching and to think carefully, to be discerning about such false teaching, to, to reject error and to pursue truth. We as pastors are to be alert, but it's not just us that have this responsibility. In Romans chapter 16, we see this is the responsibility of all believers. Uh, oftentimes when it's a little bit lengthy of a passage, it's helpful for us all to turn there. I don't know if you guys are up for it, but turn to Romans 16. I probably will start reading before you get there. But Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, you see all of our responsibility as, as Christians to be alert to the realities of false teaching. It's not just the pastor's responsibility. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, Paul appeals to the brethren. He says, Watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. 
And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. I appeal to you, brothers, Paul says, watch out for those who cause divisions. Watch out for those who teach contrary to the doctrine you've been taught. Watch out. Be alert. Wake up. Don't be sleepy to this reality of false teaching. It's of great consequence. Salvation surely is a free gift of God. But hear this warning in 2 John 8. Not that we would lose our salvation. You can't lose your salvation. It's, it's, an, it's eternal life. Uh, but we do see there, there's great cost to, to falling for deception. Those believers who get caught up in false teaching Look at what John says that it will result in. 2 John 8 goes on to warn that getting caught up in false teaching can and will lead to a loss of reward in heaven. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. So those who know the truth, that's believers. Those who walk in the truth, that's believers. We must be alert to the schemes of the deceiver, and um, be alert to it, watch out for it, do not fall for their deception. I do need to be quick here, but look at verse nine. Here's the deception, or, or here's just the reality of the deception. Um, kind of these two ways to live realities in verse nine. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. John's just showing you the important, this, this false teaching was not just some like, you know, tertiary issue. But you get Christ wrong, you get God wrong. In fact, the formula here is deny Christ and forfeit God. That's what you're seeing in, in verse nine. And um, denying Christ was what characterized these false teachers. They've gone ahead. They've moved beyond the teaching of Christ Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. They do not have God. No one can have the Father without the Son. Scriptures show, show us this. It's clear. There's no, there is, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. First John 2 John writes of the, the advocate that we have with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Let's, let's do one more cross-reference. Uh, turn, to, turn to John 14. Deny Christ, forfeit God. That's, that's the formula. Uh, there's no sal- there is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven by which men mis- must be saved. Let's think about why that, it, that is so clearly true. Think even of teaching of Christ in that same upper room discourse, chapter 14 of the Gospel of John. John 14, beginning in verse 6, Jesus' teaching says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Go down to verse 9. Um, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Um, Jesus reveals the Father. The Son reveals the Father. Uh, The Son is the way to the Father. Deny Christ, forfeit God. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. If you get Christ wrong, you don't know God. And John is so clear in this letter. So this is of great consequence. Do not let this deceptive teaching creep in to the life of your church. We must get Christ right. So wrapping up this warning to not fall into this deception, uh, the the reader is reminded, uh, don't fall for it, and certainly do not encourage their efforts either. Look at, look at verses 10 and 11. Here's, here's the situation, maybe a hypothetical. I, don't, I think John expects this to happen soon, and that's why he's writing this letter to this church. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. 
John's short letter comes to a close shortly, but here in verses 10 and 11, he, he's saying, don't do anything that would encourage their efforts. Don't give them an audience. Don't give them a voice. Don't, um, don't share a platform. Do not show him hospitality because that would only give credibility to his ministry. Do not let him in your house. Uh, I still think this, you know, a church met in a house. Don't let him in your house. Do not let him teach. Do not receive him. Don't encourage his ministry. And it's interesting, John, John practiced what he preached. Uh, I'll be real quick here, but I just think this is a, a, a helpful, fun, um, and historic reality in the life of John. There's this man, Serenthus. I think he, would, he, would, he was a heretic. He, taught, he was a deceiver. He fought uh, a false teacher. And, and his ministry uh, of, of deception took place during the life uh, of John. And, and, and there's an occasion where John and Serenthus were in the same place at the same time. And, and this, is, uh, this is how uh, Polycarp, you know, the disciple of John, um, told this, and Irenaeus is, is re- recounts what Polycarp said. There are those who heard from Polycarp that John, the disciple of the Lord, going to bathe at Ephesus and perceiving Serenthus was there in that bathhouse, rushed out of the bathhouse without bathing, exclaiming, let us flee, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Serenthus, the enemy of the truth, is within. John wasn't even comfortable, you know, in this bathhouse with the reality that Serenthus was there. Because, man, hey, the roof might cave in on this deceiver, this false teacher. Uh, and so he's saying, don't share, with, don't associate, don't give any encouragement to those false teachers. So I think for us, I mean, being very quick, I mean, that, there's just a variety of ways to apply this in our own lives. Man, be careful what, what we read. You know, don't, don't uh, on both sides of, of falling for deception, we need discernment in what we read. So we don't want to fall for these false teachings. We also don't want to do anything that would give encouragement to deceivers. So watch what we read. Watch how you have conversations with, with those who, who, who profess um, a, a heretical uh, doctrine. Don't, don't talk to them as if they are like-minded. Don't greet them. In the sense, if you think John greets the believers with grace, mercy, peace, he's saying that's something that's a reality for Christians. That's, that, peace with God is not something that's a reality for non-Christians. So don't give greetings, a brother, you know, things like that, to someone who is not in Christ, someone who holds to false teaching. We ought to be careful what we read, be careful how we talk to others, be careful what we get involved in, the organizations that we're connected to and associated with if they're connected to false teachers. And here's one that, that I think really matters in the life of the church, and, and it really uh, is, is on the radar uh, of the leadership of this church, those who lead the music and those who, who oversee just uh, the, as, as elders in the church. We have to be very careful about what we sing, because not only what we sing matters, but even, even uh, who wrote what we sing matters as well. We don't want to be associated with false teachers. And there's this license that we have for the songs that we sing. We, we pay to, to have permission to sing the songs um, so that, you know, these people write songs. And so we, we, we pay this license and the artists get paid for the songs that they write. And, and this, this licensing agency kind of communicates to you the top 100 songs that are being sung, all this stuff, that and the other. Well, let me tell you, the top 10 songs that are sung in American churches today, it's not encouraging. When you start thinking of Second John, when he's saying, don't give any encouragement to false teachers, there's a lot of encouragement to false teachers in the songs that are sung congregationally. I mean, look at the top 10. Not good. It took like, I was encouraged that by the time we got to number 12, it's in Christ alone. Thank the Lord that churches are singing in Christ alone. That's the, that's the but before that, the, the first 11, you, you have names of false teachers that, that either are involved in the writing of the lyrics or are involved in, in the music. And we ought not associate with false teachers, practical ways that we ought to be careful not to encourage their efforts, and so we ought to be careful about what we sing. I think we ought to be careful about what we listen to in regards to the songs as well. So that was fast, but, but got to finish here. Um, don't encourage their efforts. That's verses 10 and 11. And in closing, you find, find the, these final words, verses 12 and 13. 
Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Just real quickly, don't really even have time to expound on this, but do you notice that John recognizes the benefit of the physical gathering? He's got more to write. Letters are great, but man, I wanna, I wanna be with you. I wanna be face to face with you. I wanna see you. I wanna talk to you. That's what I'm gonna tell you the rest that I wanna tell you. I've run out of papyrus here. I'm gonna come see you face to face. That's what John is saying. I think for us as a church, we're reminded, man, Man, live stream's great. Phone calls are great. Letters are great. But, but we, as Christians, for the, in the love that we have for one another, we need to be together. We need to see each other face to face. There's a benefit of being face to face, gathered together physically, so that our joy may be complete. That's what, that's what John just kind of says in, in passing here in verse 12. I want to be face to face with you so that our joy may be complete. Verse 13 the children of your elect sister greet you. Verses one and verse 13, the same thing. You have this, those who are in the truth, they have a love for others that are in the truth. So this church that's in the truth is loved by this other church also walking in the truth. And so they send their greetings to this particular church. Short letter, powerful, helpful, and and convicting. It reminds us uh, as Christians, we ought to be walking in the truth. And I pray that would be true of everyone in this room. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for the truth. We thank you that that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That You sent your Son to live a perfect life, to die in our place, to, to pay for our sin so that we could be reconciled to you. There's no way be in a right relationship with you without Christ's righteousness. We need righteousness, and it's Christ alone who satisfied your wrath, who paid for our sin. So when we trust in Christ, you forgive us of our sin and credit us with Christ's righteousness. We thank you and praise you for this truth. May we all be those who would believe this truth and defend this truth and proclaim this truth and, and delight in this truth. As we go from here, God, I pray that, that you be glorify in our lives as we seek to contend for the truth that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.